All right. Deuteronomy chapter 31. Great chapter. <laughs> Again, as usual, as you've come to expect. Let's just jump in verse 1. I think the uh, first couple of verses are going to um, be such that you'll kind of get the gist of what we're in store for in this chapter and the remaining chapters in this book as we draw to the end of the book. Verse 1, we read, Then Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel. Again, he's preaching a sermon to the children of Israel. And he said to them, verse 2, I am 120 years old today. Um, happy birthday. <laughs> I, that's, I don't know if it was that day, but, you know. He says, I can no longer go out and come in. Also, the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over this Jordan. All right. As we begin this chapter, it's important to understand what Moses is not saying here. Namely, that I'm 120 years old <laughs> and I'm too old to, you know, go any further. I can't go on. That's not it at all. In fact, we'll, we'll read later that Moses at 120 years of age didn't even need glasses. He was as sharp as a tack, as they say. So that's not what he's saying here. Rather, what he is saying here is that the time has come at 120 years of age for them, as the children of Israel, to cross over the Jordan and into the promised land without him. Why? Well... The reason is because the Lord told him that he would not enter into the promised land because of what happened when they were back at a place called Meribah. Well, what happened there? Well, we have the account of what happened there in the book of Numbers chapter uh, 20, and we'll read a, a couple of verses out of Numbers 20 here in a moment, but we're told that the Israelites, because they had no water to drink, began to murmur and complain, and Moses had had it. And the response that God gives to Moses because of this is that he's to take his rod and gather the congregation, and key word, speak to the rock, so it would bring forth water for the Israelites. So what does Moses do? Well, he's off to a good start. He takes the rod from before the Lord, as God had commanded him, but he doesn't do what God told him, and he gets very angry instead. Uh, Numbers 20, verses 10 and 11, we're told that Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Okay, this is the reason that Moses, remember, the meekest man who ever walked on the face of the earth won't be able to walk into the promised land because of what he did and what's recorded here in Numbers 20, verses 10 and 11. Charles Spurgeon says, Certainly Moses erred in smiting the rock, for he was bidden to speak to it. The best of men are men at best. See, it's important to remember that Moses is human. Now that's not to excuse it, but it does explain it. Because it's so common that we take guys like Moses and we put them 
on this pedestal. And we don't realize that, hey, listen, they're, they're going to get angry. They're going to get in the flesh too. They're going to get angry too. I mean, the best of men are men at best still. And it's for this reason that Moses was forbidden entrance into the promised land. Now, don't miss this because Moses is so angry at the Israelites that he even calls them names. Now, it's not necessarily visible at first glance, but he starts taking his anger out not just on the rock. <laughs> I mean, he's beating that. Can you just picture a beating that? You know, he's away, you know, to, and, but he's taking it out on the Israelites too. Now, in the original language, this word in actually the Greek, the New Testament that is used here for rebels is the word maros. Well, so what? What does that mean? Well, it's where we get our English word moron. <laughs> See for yourself. Go into the original. <laughs> in other words, Moses, the meekest man who ever walked on the face of the earth, the most humble man, the most godly leader, is calling them morons. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? I mean, God forbid. I get so angry at you as your pastor. I stand up here one day, and I'm just beating the sheep, and I call you a bunch of morons. How would you feel about that? Well, that's what happened. By the way, that will never happen. It's not that I'm above that or that's beneath me. I am certainly a man at best and fully capable of doing that, but I won't. I haven't. Have I? I don't think I ever have. To go back and listen to all those teachings to make sure. But, you know, it's interesting. There's even a reference to this disastrous sin of anger on the part of Moses that's recorded in, of all places, the book of Psalms. And it's found in Psalms 106, verses 32 and 33. Listen to what the psalmist records. By the waters of Meribah, they angered the Lord, and trouble came to Moses because of them. I, I, that's interesting. In other words... Just because Moses got angry doesn't mean the Israelites were off the hook. I mean, they sinned greatly and caused much trouble because of it. But it says, for they rebelled against the Spirit of God and rash words came from Moses' lips. Translated, he cursed them. <laughs> He called them names, rash words. In Numbers 20, verses 12 and 13, we read what happens next. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. That's why we have what we have in Deuteronomy 31, verses 1 and 2. That's what Moses is saying. He's saying this is why. In verse 13, this was the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and he was hallowed among them. Okay. A couple of thoughts here, the first of which is that I really feel for Moses. I mean, I can't even begin to imagine how Moses must have felt when he heard the Lord say this to him. I mean, think about it. <laughs> I mean, he has led the children of Israel so faithfully through thick and through thin in sickness and in health. <laughs> I mean, through unspeakable adversity and then he comes to this place and with the striking of the rock, blows it, for lack of a better way of saying it. 
Perhaps you'll indulge me for just a moment because I think that it's incumbent upon me to take a closer look at what's going on here. I mean, I, ca I can't just, even though we looked at this in Numbers 20, uh, I can't quite resist the opportunity to really delve into this account of what happened because it is so packed, so full of so much for us here tonight. I mean, there's so many lessons here for us that we can learn from. Learning, if you will, by proxy from Moses' sin. Now, Moses has been faithful in serving the Lord, and it would seem almost unjust and unfair that just because he loses his temper, he's done. He's forbidden from entering into the promised land. I mean, it, it seems disproportionate at first glance that this disqualification of Moses is seemingly all because of this one sin of anger, this lapse of judgment, this getting into the flesh, this one mistake. You mean to tell me that in my service to the Lord, in my walk with the Lord, that I'm, I'm walking on eggshells, watching my P's and Q's, which, by the way, I have no idea what watching your P's and Q's means. I'm trying to figure it out. You know, the P, you know, and the Q, and you got to watch. Maybe somebody can, after the teaching, share with me where that came from. But anyway, um, I would be always on edge wondering, oh, my goodness, I... I, I better be careful because if I lose it, if I lose my timber, if I get in the flesh and I'm angry, I'm disqualified. That's not the case. And I'll tell you why. Because when you take a closer look at it, what you find is that this was just in what the Lord meted out in keeping Moses out of the promised land. Now, I want to share with you a number of things that I believe are at play here. And the first one is, is that Moses misrepresented God's nature. Then he deliberately disobeyed God's command. And if that weren't bad enough, he exalted himself to God's power. He did it all sort of simultaneously in just that one sin of anger. His misrepresenting came when he became angry with the children of Israel, which implied that if Moses is mad, then so too must God also be mad. You have to understand that Moses is the representative of God to the people, just as the, also the high priest his brother Aaron was a representative of the people before God. And Moses, in a sense, was both. So this is huge. And his disobeying came when he struck the rock twice instead of speaking to it once, which also implied that the rock had to continually be smitten. I think most of you are aware as we'll talk about in a moment, the typology here, because that rock is a type of the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was only to be smitten once. I'm getting ahead of myself. He's exalting himself when he says, must we bring water for you out of this rock? And that implied that he and Aaron were at par with God. I just, I mean, it's kind of humorous. I, the way I see the account is when he says, must we? And I can just imagine God in heaven going, excuse me? What's this we stuff, Moses? We? You mean you and me? You're at par with me? You're at the same level as me? Like we have added up to here with them? We? 
No, not we, me. <laughs> it's me, Moses, not we. Big mistake. Now, it's as if God is saying, Moses, you deliberately disobeyed me, you blatantly misrepresented me, and you made yourself equal to me. Now, this brings us back to our question, which begs an answer. Why would God disqualify Moses after walking so faithfully for all of those years? I believe the reason is chiefly, supremely, because Moses ruined the typology as it relates to Jesus Christ, who again was the rock, and he was smitten only once. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians in his first epistle, chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. He says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. In other words, the typology of them walking on dry ground through the parted waters was a baptism of sorts. See? So you were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. Watch this. For they drank from the spiritual rock. That's the rock. That accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. So I, again, they weren't off the hook. I mean, the emphasis here is on what Moses did, but never imagined that they would, would not suffer the consequences of what they did. Now, the thought here again is that Jesus, as the rock, was smitten only once when he was crucified on the cross. In other words, you don't continually crucify the Christ as the Catholics seem to want to continue to do by keeping him on the crucifix. My son asked me the other day, he said, uh, what's the difference between the crucifix and the cross? Is that the crucifix still has Christ on there. That's why it's the crucifix. But the cross, he's gone. And <laughs> that's why... Anyway, so you don't continually crucify, you don't continually smite the Christ. He's only smitten. He's only crucified one time for all the sins of all mankind. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 12. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when the priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, speaking of Jesus Christ. See, in the Old Testament, it was kofar, cover, the sacrifices which had to continually be made, only covered. But Jesus Christ, who would fulfill the sacrificial system, became that one sacrifice smitten only once, once and for all, and that was it. And then he would, for all time, sacrifice for sins and then be seated at the right hand of the Father. Now... Again, to kind of take the typology even further, we can speak to the rock. We can speak to the rock who is Jesus Christ and ask for the Holy Spirit from him to overflow us, to fill us to overflowing so our lives become torrents of living water. See, the typology is the water, a type of the Holy Spirit. The rock from where the water would come forth, a type of the Christ. You speak to the Christ. You speak to the rock, already smitten, once and for all. And then what comes forth? Torrents of living water. The Holy Spirit, there for the asking, 
Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. I know you're familiar with this passage. So I say to you, Jesus is speaking, ask, speak, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him, speak to him, ask of him. It's there for the asking now because he's already been smitten. And then subsequent to the smiting of the rock, the Christ, we now can have the water, the Holy Spirit come forth. Here in John 4.10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. There's the typology, the water there for the asking, simply by speaking. John's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood in fulfillment, by the way, and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Have you asked? You have not because you ask not. You you can have the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit if you will simply speak to and ask of the rock and he will give it to you. That's the typology. That's the promise. That's what we have and are under in the new covenant. I suppose one takeaway from this is that the sin of misrepresenting God as being angry has to be taken with the utmost seriousness. I mean, when you understand the typology and then you take it from that into the practical, there is a very serious and even sober and practical lesson to be learned in this. Now, stay with me. How many of you would agree with me that people who don't know the Lord believe that the Lord is angry with them. And Satan has really succeeded in getting people to believe that. And it's not true. God is not angry. God has placed all of his anger and all of his wrath on his only begotten son, and that's why there is therefore now no condemnation, no anger, no wrath for those that are in Christ Jesus. He's already smitten the sun, the rock, placed upon him that wrath. So to misrepresent this God who is not angry as angry has serious eternal ramifications. Because see, if you believe God is angry, then you're going to keep your distance. I've often shared about growing up in my home, my father was always angry. I mean, he was just an angry man. And I, you know, if I could be candid and maybe even transparent, this has been an issue for me. I mean, anger has been resonant in my life and God has really had to deal with me in this area but I just remember times as a young boy not wanting to be anywhere near <laughs> my dad in fact I would try to sleep in so that you know and not wake up until after he left the house in the morning and I would try to go to bed early at night before you know he got home at night so that I would never have to 
you know, be subjected to his anger. He was just an angry man. And I wanted to keep my distance from him. Now, there's a problem here. And I think this problem is repeated in a myriad of ways in many a Christian's life. Because, see, we tend to see our Heavenly Father through the lens of our earthly father. And if our Heavenly Father, if our earthly father is always angry, then we're, we're going to interpret it as our Heavenly Father being always angry as well. And instead of wanting to draw near to Him, we're going to want to, you know, keep away from Him because of it. And that's the problem. And see, you, you almost create this antithesis of who God is. Here's a God who is a God of love, a God of mercy, slow to anger, full of mercy and compassion and, and kindness. And, and then for Moses to do this basically is so serious that God says, you know what? Now we're going to see more typology here when we get into the book of Joshua because as you know, Joshua will succeed Joseph. We'll see at the end of the chapter where he gets inaugurated as the successor of Moses. See, Moses is a type of the law and Joshua, which by the way is Yeshua. It's Jesus. That's the Hebrew for Jesus. We, they don't pronounce the J in, in Hebrew. Uh, so Yahshua, Joshua is Yahshua. In Arabic, we say Yahshua. That's Jesus. So in other words, the law cannot enter in. But Jesus, who fulfills the law and whom is pictured in typology in, in Joshua. See, Moses is a type of the law and Joshua a type of the Christ. Again, we're in store for such a grand and glorious study when we get into the book of Joshua in the not too distant future, depending on how fast we go through these remaining chapters in Deuteronomy. But uh, again, the typology is just destroyed. And there's another component to this, and I think it's that obedience to God especially for those in positions of leadership, is an absolute must for any leader because of this one dynamic. And really another lesson that's learned in concert with that is that those in positions of leadership will be held to a much higher account before God because of this, because they are the representative of God. They are leading people in their relationship to God, closer to God. And if they misrepresent him, they will have to give an account. This is what James says, chapter 3, verse 1. Excuse me, not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. <laughs> Listen, I... I don't like verses like this as a pastor and a teacher because this just, well, it, it scares me a little bit because I think to myself, oh my goodness. So, you know, because, and I, and I, I, actually it was Greg Laurie. I totally stole this from Greg Laurie. He, you know, paints this picture in heaven of this line as you're, you know, entering in and, you know, only to hear the words from the Savior, well done, good and faithful servant, enter in. And, and so you, you're in the, the line that, you know, you're not in the teacher line. You're not in the pastor line. The pastors are in a different line. And it is moving really slow <laughs> and because we're judged by a higher standard. You know, and he just, he makes it so humorous. But I wonder if there's some merit to that. We will be judged more strictly. Now, some have suggested that this has a twofold meaning. Yes, we will be judged more strictly, held to a higher account by the Lord, but we're also judged more strictly and held to a higher account by the Lord's people, and rightfully so. Our lives should be above reproach as leaders, as pastors, and as teachers. Now, 
Be that as it may, at least for me anyway, one of the most powerful lessons in all of this, yes, we got the typology, we have the misrepresentation, all of that, but to me personally, candidly, one of the most powerful lessons is how we're all prone to fail in the areas of greatest strength. See, for Moses to do this at this time and at this way as the meekest, most patient and humble man that walked the face of the earth, his greatest strength, he failed, he fell, he faltered in the area of his greatest strength. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, when Paul writes, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. I love what Oswald Chambers said in my utmost for his highest on April 19th. He wrote, unguarded strength is double weakness because that is where the retired sphere of the least saps. I love that English. Let me try to translate that. In other words, that's where you would least expect it. That's where it saps you, zaps you, sneaks up on you and behind you. He goes on to say, the Bible characters fell on their strong points, never on their weak ones. Kept by the power of God, that is the only safety. Now this encourages me. If for no other reason other than Moses is not alone in this. Actually, he's in very good company because the scriptures are replete with failures of great men of God. I think of King David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, a man after God's own heart, falls with less than his heart. Here's a man who's after the things of God, a heart for God, and yet he allows lust to enter his heart for Bathsheba and then murder to enter his heart when he murders or has his husband, her husband Uriah murdered. How about the Apostle Peter, my favorite? I, I love Peter so much. He's my friend. <laughs> I mean, this guy, I just seriously, honestly, literally, I cannot wait to meet him in glory. You know, I, and it's not going to be hard to, to find him <laughs> and pick him out. I mean, mercy. Everybody's got him at the, ga the pearly gate, so I guess we're going to see him right at the entrance, which is not biblical. I can't find it anywhere in the scriptures. But anyway, he'll be there, and we'll know who he is. He won't have to introduce himself to us. I mean, that'd be weird, wouldn't it? You're, you're in heaven, you go, oh, I made it, I can't believe it. And you walk up, and here's this guy, and, wow, that guy made it too. And you go up and you introduce yourself to him, hey, my name's J.D., I made glory, glory, worthy, worthy. He says, oh, J.D., I'm so glad to meet you. I'm Peter. Oh, no, Peter! No way, way, you, yes, me. That's not how it's going to be, but anyway, that's how I... Imagine it after I make it through that long line that's going really slow. But Peter, courageous enough to walk on water, then take on the entire Roman army, yet he falls how, where, when, when he denies Jesus in his cowardice before a servant girl. I mean, how is that possible? Well, I know in my own life that in those areas that I think I stand the strongest, I tend to sort of let my guard down. I figure, you know, I got that. that that's shored up. That's, you know, kind of, you know, taken care of. And I don't have to really worry about that because, you know, I'm doing pretty good in that area. Ooh. That's the area. But you see, Conversely, in those areas of weakness, we tend to really pay more attention because we know that we're vulnerable 
in those areas. So we let our guard down in the areas that we think, we think we're strong in, and then we you know, put all the emphasis and give all the attention to those areas that we're weak in, and it's the areas, not that we're weak in, but the areas that we're strong in that we fail and fall. Every time we begin the new year, I don't know if, you know, if you're like me, you probably are, you know, because you're a sinner too, just like me. <laughs> but I'm always riddled with the failures of the past New Year's. I'm not talking resolutions. I, I stopped doing that a long time ago. I mean, it, you know, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I figured out that my, 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 in fact, here's, I'll show you my last New Year's resolution. You ready for this? My last New Year's resolution I ever made to never make another New Year's resolution. <laughs> and I kept it, and it was great, and I feel really good about it. But every time that we start a new year, I just, I'm always just almost plagued and riddled with all of my failures. You know, I, I didn't, you know, do what I wanted to do last year and so then you try to start off the new year and you think okay well I'm just gonna and then you fail and you fall and you you know just are miserable and therein lies the encouragement because God is so gracious I mean failure in our lives in fact let me just say this Failure in our lives is necessary. I doubt whether or not any man or woman of God can experience the blessing of God, success as defined by God in their Christian walk, absent failure. See, failure is not really failure if you learn from it and you grow because of it. See, failure should never have the final word in our lives. It didn't in Peter's life. It didn't in Moses' life. Why? Because God is both merciful and gracious to restore them. He restores Moses. He restores Peter. It's interesting how that God restores Moses. You know, Moses does see the promised land. No, he, he doesn't see it with the Israelites, which... You know, if I'm Moses, I'm thinking, you know what? I really don't want to go in there with you anyway. <laughs> I mean, I have just, I have been, I am so sick of you guys. You know, I, I mean, no, no, it's, 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 there's some truth to this because, now think about this, because this was God's blessing on, on Moses, you know, because, you know, you might think you want to go in there with them, but listen, <laughs> I have just spent the last 80 years of my life with these people. You know, I, 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 I need to get away from him. And God says, okay, let's go. Come up, come up here. I'll, I'll get you in the promised land. In fact, you know what? Instead of going in the promised land with him, you're going to go in with me and Elijah at the Mount of Transfiguration. <laughs> Can you, listen, so, you know, in other words, yeah, feel bad for Moses, but I don't think for a minute that Moses felt bad after he thought, oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. I, I, I like that better. In other words, if, if God had hypothetically, theoretically given Moses a choice, okay, Moses, here's your choice. You can go in with these murmuring, complaining, you know, children of Israel. They're, they're worse than their parents, you know, because their parents are not with them now. This is the next generation. And you can take them in there, and you can enter the promised land, and, or you can have an all-expense-paid trip <laughs> with me <laughs> later on I don't think that's a that's even a decision I'm, I'm picking behind door number two I want to go with you Lord and that's how it goes down you know God in his mercy and I can't get over this think about this in his mercy he's still faithful to provide the water from the rock in spite of what Moses did. That's this God that we serve. That's who he is. That's his grace. 
See, now, if I'm God, I'm thinking, you know what? No. No. For one thing, I've had it. You guys keep complaining and murmuring. I'm not even going to tell Moses to speak to the rock. Forget it. And then Moses, he you, 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 you smites the rock. Really? Yeah, no. Huh? Forget it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to let water come out of that rock. That'll teach you. Is that how, how? Listen, don't look at me like that all smug and pious. That's how we parent, isn't it, parents? That'll teach you a lesson. I'm not going to let you have. No, this is grace. God is being gracious and merciful. Grace giving them what they don't deserve and mercy not giving them what they do deserve. That's the nature of who God is. And that's the encouragement. That's the encouragement for me. That's the encouragement for you. God is a gracious God. Are we not learning about grace in Romans? What grace is, what grace is not? This is what grace is. This is what grace does. God is a gracious God. Listen, I have been the recipient of such grace from God in times where I have misrepresented him. I've gotten in the flesh and become angry. Listen, you can be angry and not sin, but that's righteous anger. And if you're honest with yourself, not many of us are righteous in our anger. I mean, so many times, well, actually, not that many times. I'm actually a very godly man. I'm your pastor. So I've only gotten angry, uh, let's see, one, two, okay, a lot of times. <laughs> More times than I would care to ever share. <laughs> but God has been so faithful to just show me such grace. And such mercy. He forgives. He cleanses. And that's what he did here. One final thought. Moses remains faithful even after the unspeakable disappointment of not being allowed to enter the promised land. Now, this is one of those things that you have to really kind of think through because... Again, at first glance, it's not that evident. But think about this. After the whole rock thing, after God says, that's it, you're not going into the promised land, uh, he still is faithful and obedient to the call of God in his life. I mean, this is so remarkable because it's so rare and it's so rare because it's so hard to find someone with a mature strength of character to remain faithful when told no no Moses you cannot enter the promised land and to remain faithful on the heels of not getting what you want. That's what James says, causes quarrels and fights amongst you. You want something, but you don't get it. What you do get is a no. And then watch what happens after the no. In all my years as a pastor, on the mainland, of course, the mainland, not here, the mainland, Sadly, I've watched so many people leave the church, even split the church. And you know why? It was all because they couldn't do what they wanted to do in the church. They didn't get their way. They didn't get what they wanted. They got a no. And so when they got the no, that's it. They're not going to serve anymore. And they're angry. At least to the credit of Moses, to see this man, this godly man, this meek man, 
after the no, say, you know what? I will still go. I will still do. I will still remain faithful. I'll keep my hands to the plow. I won't look back. And that's what he does. Well, that was verses 1 and 2. So, <laughs> again, I, you'll forgive me, but <laughs> seriously, this particular uh, teaching, both here in Deuteronomy 31 and also in Numbers 20, has been so powerful and so personal in my own life over the years, in the ministry, especially in the pastorate, because God has used this Really, and God has saved me because of this. God has taught me many things about how destructive anger is. You can destroy with anger so much and so many, and it is so serious, and this is why we have so much that's given to what Moses did in his anger. Well, let's just see how much farther we can get. Obviously, we're not going to finish the chapter tonight. Verse 3, the Lord your God himself crosses over before you. He will destroy these nations from before you, and you shall dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you, just as the Lord has said, and the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the king of kings of the Amorites and their land when he destroyed them. The Lord will give them over to you that you may do to them according to every commandment which I have commanded you. I love passages like this. And I'll tell you why. They speak to the faithfulness of God, yet future, based on the faithfulness of God in the past. See, here's what Moses is saying to them. God is going to dispossess the land that you are entering of those enemy nations, just as he did in the past with the other enemies. And he lists them by name. This is the David-Goliath thing. This is when Saul to David, then believed to be only a teenager, says... You're out of your mind. This champion, which is what the name Goliath means, will destroy you. And David says to him, you don't understand what God has already done in the past. So my defeating in the name of the Lord of this you call champion, I call an uncircumcised Philistine, is no problem because in the past God delivered into my hands a bear and a lion. Israelites, God in the past delivered these kings of the Amorites into your hands and so too will he dispossess the land of the nations now that yet future you will battle against. You know, <laughs> have you in your, you know, kind of outlook of the upcoming year of fear as they're calling it H have you kind of come out of that thinking wow <laughs> this is going to be a really interesting year I mean you don't think it's going to actually get better do you and I'm just asking I, I don't mean to sound condescending or antagonistic here but I mean <laughs> I think you know what I mean right Okay, for one thing, it's an election year. Now, please, uh, do you actually think that if there's a new president that things will actually just change? If you do, I've got this car that... Uh, <laughs> not really. Actually, I sort of do, but... <laughs> I mean, you got to be kidding me. Seriously? Do you think that as gnarly as 2011 was, that 2012 is going to be, you know, hey, things are going to turn around. <laughs> They're not going to turn around. <laughs> uh, I, something else could happen, but it won't be a turnaround. Now, 
why do I say that? I say that to say this. Think about what God has done in your life heretofore. The victories that have been wrought in your life by the hand of God. Now, take that as a template of sorts and superimpose it upon that which is yet future, specifically this year of fear, 2012. God is faithful. God is faithful yet future because of what God did in the past. In other words, Moses is reminding the Israelites of what God had already done prior because he wants to build their confidence, not in themselves, but in their God for what he's about to do upcoming. Now, we're going to see this in the next verse. In fact, we'll just go ahead with... Um, okay, yeah, let's, let's go to at least verses 6 through 8. We'll, we'll try to <laughs> do this. Uh, what we're going to see here is that God wants the Israelites to be both strong and courageous. Now, we're going to get really... Uh, familiar with these two words when we get into the book of Joshua, but, and the, and the reason is, is because God knows us so well. He knows full well how prone we are to become af afraid and fearful. Now watch what happens here in verse 6. He says, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land. <laughs> you get to go in there with them. That, it's not like that. At least I don't think so. You must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Wow, what a word fitly spoken. Isn't it just amazing how words recorded so many generations ago are so apropos for us here today. This, that's God's word. It never fails. It never returns void. Again, when we get into the first chapter of Joshua, we're going to hear this over and over again. And it's because I believe there's something here as it relates to fear and why it is that fear has no place in the life of a believer. It has no place in the life of the Israelites entering into the promised land, and so too does it have no place in the life of a believer. See, I can't picture God ever saying to us, don't be afraid without also telling us why it is that we don't have to be afraid. Now, consider Hebrews chapter 13, the first part of verse 5 and verse 6. It echoes what we just heard Moses say. God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? You, if, you, if you want to mess with me, you're going to have to take it up with my heavenly Father, and you don't want to do that. He goes before me. He is for me. Who can be against me? He will never leave me or forsake me. What in the world do I have to be afraid of? One minute spent worrying. One minute spent fretting, one minute spent in fear is one minute that is wasted. It's a minute you'll never be able to have again in your life. It is a waste of time. It has no place in our lives. 
and it should never be given a place in our lives because God will never leave you. You know, it's with a sort of a sanctified, if I can say it this way, a sanctified confidence in the Lord that I am ready to face the year and all that's scheduled in it and for us uh, during it, which, I mean, some of the predictions and forecasts and, you know, uh, I mean, they're, they, they are just perilous. I mean, it is so depressing and distressing. I mean, you start reading these things, I don't recommend it. In fact, I had to stop. I just, I was doing some research for the Sunday prophecy update, and I just finally said, that's it. I've had it. Forget it, man. I mean, just shoot me now, will you? <laughs> I mean, some of the things they're saying, in March there's going to be this, and you're thinking, oh, what are going to do? And then I just, the Lord's going, really? You're teaching on fear tonight, and you're, you know, freaking out about this? <laughs> Why don't you all stand? We're going to bring it in for a landing. What a place to end it, right? We'll pick it, <laughs> we'll pick it up in verse 9 next week, Lord willing, if we're still here, I think. Let's pray. <laughs> oh, Lord, thank you so much. Thank you that you will never leave us or forsake us. Thank you that you do not pay us as our sins so deserve. Lord, thank you that you are so merciful to us and so faithful always. Lord, I pray that as we've studied this passage in this chapter tonight, that we would take it to the next level and let this study in this chapter tonight study us and really search us and see if there be anything within us that is causing us to fear and falter and fail. And Lord, we just desperately need for you by your Holy Spirit to minister these truths in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.